Hello, and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, and you like listening to horror stories, hit subscribe down below and join us. Also, please leave a like before we get started. Can we get 600? Thank you. The doorbell went off, echoing throughout my entire house. Female, 29. I ran down the stairs, wondering who could be at the front door. When I got to it, I unlocked the door and quickly glanced through the window. At the side of my living room stood there was my cousin Charlotte. She was the type of girl that was so knowledgeable, so sweet, and so kind. I couldn't just not let her in, even if I hadn't seen her for over two years. As I opened the door, there was a massive smile on her face. Stood next to her was a man who towered over her in height. He was smartly dressed, had a pretty impressive beard, and had some funny colored shoes on, which also caught my attention when I looked down. Come in, come in, I said to them. It's been so long. What are you guys doing here? Well, we came to tell you something. We have some news to bring you. We're getting married. This is Tim. I've been dating him for the past year. I met him out in Switzerland while I was on my studies. No way, that's insane, I said. I cooked them both up some food and ended up making them a coffee. Tim was a chill dude and I got along with him quite well. I knew that whoever Charlotte picked, I would get along with him. Seeing as myself and Charlotte always got on, even when we were a lot younger. How have you been? It's been so long. I must have said that around 10 times before she finally answered the question. I've been in Switzerland. I bumped into Tim at a nightclub. I know, doesn't exactly sound too romantic, does it? We all laughed. Well, you guys are a fit, and I'm telling you that honestly. Stop it. Stop being so funny, we chatted for the rest of that night. They ended up staying around for over four hours. By the end, when I saw them off down the drive, I had lost my voice. I'd been speaking so much, as I'd been so happy finally see her. Once my energy slowly drained from my body, as I waved them farewell, as they pulled out of the drive, driving off into the distance, I let out a sigh of exhaustion. I'm not the type of girl who likes being around lots of people. I love my family, but sometimes I just feel drained and exhausted especially in social interactions with conversations. I locked the door as it was now pretty late. I had dinner with them after making them a meal, so I guess that was sorted. All I had planned for the rest of the night was to go upstairs and grab a bath. While they were here, they had invited me to their wedding. Of course, I'm going to go. So I stuck the invite right on the edge of my fridge using a fridge magnet just in case I forgot, seeing as I'm a pretty forgetful girl. Now I work full time. I went upstairs, undressed, and started running the bath. It took around 10 to 20 minutes for the bath to fully run up to the top. I threw in my favorite lavender bath bomb, and the scents hit me up my nose. Relaxation set in as I put the bath to the perfect temperature perfect temperature being so hot you can barely get in. That way it takes a while to cool down, so you don't have to keep running in hot water over and over again. As I laid there in the bath, I genuinely felt so happy for Charlotte. The fact that I hadn't seen her in two years, and she had done so much with her life since then, was surprising. One thought that I couldn't help but shake after this was the thought of jealousy. I didn't feel like this was coming from my honest, congruent self. Instead, it felt like it was coming from an evil side of me, like I was envying her getting married. I got out of the bath and went to bed, 
trying to ignore these pretty disgusting and selfish thoughts I was having. I guess it's just human nature. It doesn't matter how much of a nice or kind person you are. If you see someone taller, more in shape, more attractive, a better car or something. It's just the animalistic side of us. I guess natural selection could explain it. I went to bed that night and had a couple of dreams about the wedding. I'm pretty good at doing dreams, or as some of you would call lucid dreams. I just call them dreams. Seeing as in most of them, I do actually have quite a lot of control. Her wedding was due to take place in five months. It was going to happen at a castle. A castle fit for a king, may I say. When the wedding came around, I found myself a nice dress. I decided to rent one. Seeing as I didn't have any wedding dresses, and obviously, me being a bridesmaid, I wouldn't be wearing the actual white or highlight dress that the usual bride would wear. The one I found was pink, as apparently, this is what she wanted the bridesmaids to wear. A mixture of darker purple and darker pink. Don't tell me that's supposed to go. But somehow it did. The day went really well, and I caught up with long-lost family members I hadn't seen since I was a kid. Once again, though, at the end of all this, when I went back to my hotel room, I was absolutely zoned. I couldn't even think straight and collapsed straight onto the bed with my dress still on. I woke up eight hours later, around six o'clock in the morning, at the crack of dawn. The birds were chirping outside. A new lease of life pumping through my lungs as the fresh air that had come through the window I left open the previous night filled the entire room. It was cold, as I had basically collapsed on the bed without putting the covers over my whole body. I got out of my dress and hopped in the shower. Once again, the good old saying of shower thoughts. I kept thinking and contemplating, pondering on and on about how I'd be single forever. I felt like there was no escape, no way out, and that I stood no chance at meeting anyone forever. It's a daunting thought and a terrible feeling that can make some girls feel sick to their stomachs. I drove back to my house and settled in once more. Her wedding was a few hours away, so the traveling was pretty strenuous and stressful. Also, all I know is I enjoyed the wedding. I sent a thank you card to Charlotte and congratulations to her and Tim. They went on their honeymoon. Sending me signals through a fake profile the whole situation felt surreal, and my mind was racing with various scenarios. I quickly messaged him, unsure of what to expect. Hey, Nate, right? Your profile caught my attention, and I couldn't help but notice you look a lot like someone I know. Just curious, is that really you? The response came surprisingly fast. Hey! Yeah, it's me, Nate. Why do you ask? Do I remind you of someone? Feeling a mix of relief and confusion, I decided to be direct. Actually, you look a lot like my cousin Charlotte's husband, Tim. It's uncanny. Are you sure you're not related or something? There was a brief pause, and then Nate replied, Oh, really? That's interesting. I don't think I have any relatives named Charlotte or Tim must be a coincidence. His response didn't fully convince me, but I didn't want to push it further. Instead, we continued chatting about various topics. As days passed, our conversations became more engaging, and I found myself growing increasingly comfortable with Nate. One evening, he suggested meeting in person. Despite the initial hesitation, I agreed. We chose a public place a cozy coffee shop to ensure safety. When I arrived, I scanned the room nervously until I spotted someone who looked exactly like Tim. It was Nate. We exchanged pleasantries, and as we talked, I 
couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off. He seemed too perfect, almost like a copy of Tim. I decided to steer the conversation towards his past, asking about his family and upbringing. Nate's responses were vague, and he skillfully avoided providing concrete details. As the conversation progressed, a growing unease settled within me. It felt like I was talking to someone who knew me intimately, but was hiding behind a facade. Eventually, I mustered the courage to directly address the similarity with Tim, Nate's to meet to the bedposts. Panic surged through me as I struggled against the restraints. The other figure stood there, silent and ominous. What do you want? Please, just let me go, I pleaded, my voice trembling with fear. The masked figures remained silent, their intentions unclear. My mind raced, wondering if this was some sick prank, or if there was a more sinister motive behind this intrusion. As I continued to beg for answers, one of the figures pulled out a smartphone and started showing me pictures. To my horror, the images displayed were screenshots of my conversations with Nate on Tinder. They had detailed information about my life, my whereabouts, and even pictures of the recent wedding I attended. My heart pounded in my chest as I realized the gravity of the situation. This wasn't a random break-in. Someone had been meticulously watching and tracking me. The fear intensified when they started mentioning specific details about my family, my daily routine, and the recent incident with Nate. Why are you doing this? What do you want from me? I shouted, desperation in my voice. They remained silent, their masked faces betraying no emotion. Suddenly, the room plunged into darkness as they turned off the lights. The oppressive silence was shattered by the sound of heavy breathing, and I could feel their presence looming over me. Time seemed to stretch as I lay there, paralyzed by fear and uncertainty. The intruders seemed to be waiting for something, and I dreaded what might come next. The room felt colder, and the air became thick with tension. Just when I thought I couldn't bear it any longer, the lights flickered back on figures were gone, leaving me alone in my bound and helpless state. Panic and confusion gripped me as I struggled to comprehend the bizarre and terrifying ordeal that had just unfolded. With great effort, I managed to free myself from the restraints and stumbled to my phone. Frantically, I dialed the police, recounting the nightmarish intrusion and the unnerving knowledge they possessed about my life. As I awaited the arrival of law enforcement, a chilling thought crept into my mind. The possibility that the catfishing incident with Tim's stolen photos on Tinder might have been a precursor to something much darker. A sinister plan that involved me as the unwitting victim. Little did I know that the investigation that followed would uncover a web of deceit, obsession, and a connection to the supernatural, intertwining my life with a horror beyond imagination. Together, I couldn't move at all as I lay there, screaming. One of the guys noticed this and turned around. He taped my mouth, then proceeded to go around the entire house ransacking and smashing everything to bits. Once they had finished, and I'd been hearing them smash everything up for the past few minutes, one of the guys came back into my room. He picked me up again, and I couldn't scream. Everything that came out was muffled by the tape. I had a pretty bad blocked nose. I was genuinely panicking, thinking I was about to suffocate. I tried to relax focusing on breathing and trying not to die of a heart attack. The men took me downstairs, looking out the windows, as if to see if there were any cops or anyone around. After a few minutes of checking, 
and me trying not to succumb to a blocked nose. They carried me out down the driveway and bundled me into the back of a van. It was dark. I couldn't see anything, but could hear things rattling around in the back with me. I lost track of time, and what felt like a few minutes turned into a few hours. I was in no state to fall asleep, but that's how long I was in there. My body became accustomed to it, but the anxiety never dropped. The panic stayed there, no matter what. Eventually, I heard the truck pull up. It stopped, and I could feel the motion cease. Then I heard some noises at the front door shutting. No one came to get me, and I think I was left in the van for a couple of days. I urinated on myself and felt like I was no longer a human with dignity or pride. When I got out, I was found by a group of people who were hiking. The van was stolen and abandoned by the two guys. When I went out back and told them what happened, the cops arrived and tried to find who did it, but no one was ever found. When they questioned Tim about what happened, the scary part was they found loads of surgical masks by his bedside table. This was past the virus, but I'm not accusing him of anything, as that would be falsely accusing without evidence. Well, that's what the judge told me, but I have my own thoughts and opinions, and I'm free to express them. I haven't given away the last names of anyone in this story, and for all you guys could know, the names I gave were fake anyway. Charlotte stopped talking to me. She cut all ties with me and my family, claiming that I was nuts. Although I was abducted, it was by random men with no motive whatsoever. I think there are two possibilities. Let me rephrase that. My friend says, there are two possibilities. One, Tim actually wanted to date me secretly. When I said no, he got angry. The laughing over the phone was all fake, and apparently he's a master manipulator. Two, he got angry that I found out he was cheating on Charlotte, his newly married wife. Well, I don't know, because those aren't my thoughts. Those are my friend's thoughts. She lives underground in Thailand. My Tinder date almost killed me. Indirectly, when I was younger, I used to tell my friends that I've always wanted to have a motorbike. Being a girl, it was kind of frowned upon, even back in 2015. But as a whole, I was seeking adventure, adrenaline, and the thrill of it all. When I met Mike, it was everything I'd ever dreamed of. At first, he took me out on his bike, and it was the first time I'd ever been on the back of one, a Harley. It sounded so loud it nearly burst my eardrums, but I loved it. Everything about the feeling, the sensation, the sounds, and of course, the pump of adrenaline. It actually made me feel alive, unlike my day-to-day -day mundane existence. Studying at university felt wholly pointless to me. I was only there to please my parents, the second I left their house, I planned on doing whatever I wanted. I looked at life as a game, and being with Mike meant that I could actually play it. I grew up in a family of four, with two older brothers and one younger sister. My mom and dad were pretty old when they had all of us, and they were disciplined, boring parents. My dad would beat me, and my mom would scream at me for whatever reason she could find. We weren't allowed phones until we turned 17 years old. And even then, they used to take them off us and scroll through everything we had been doing on them. While I agree with protecting your kids on social media, my mom and dad were horrible to me. And I think that's why I turned out this way in later life. When I reached 20 on my first date with Mike, the guy I met through Tinder, I ended up falling in love with motorcycles. I did everything I could to find out how I could get my own license. Looking online, the bikes themselves didn't seem too expensive. 
most of them a quarter of the price of decent cars. This worked out well for me, but looking back, I had no idea of the dangers that came with biking and how it actually required skill. I started training to take my test, and at first, Mike would let me have a go on his bike. It's not ideal to ride a Harley on your test, but if I had to, then I would. It wasn't that I couldn't afford my own bike. It's just that there didn't seem to be anything in the local area that fitted my size, or wasn't way too powerful. I was in love with Mike, and he had been teaching me for around two months. I'm a slow learner as I have dyslexia and other learning difficulties. He took his time being gentle and above all, patient. On some of these lessons, he turned them into cute dates and we'd end up going to a little cafe or grabbing a drink at a bar. No, we'd never go over the legal limit. Having fun on the lessons was the way I got. Make a lot of mistakes probably messing up the clutch on his bike so bad that he had to replace it at least twice during those three months. I stalled so much. The engine sounded awful at times. There were moments when I was so bad at finding the bite point that I just wanted to give up, drop my body off the bike, and cry. In actual fact, I did do that a couple of times, and myself and Mike decided to take a break from teaching me. We went back to our usual dates, and at this point, we'd been together for around half a year. I bought all my gear, levers, helmet, gloves, visor, eye protection, and boots. In total, I must have spent around $800 just on my gear alone. When it finally came to my test day, I was extremely nervous, so nervous that I failed awfully. I almost fell off the bike, and the tester, who was on his own bike behind me, had to save me and hold the bike in place. Mike was extremely pissed when he found out that I'd scraped the side of his bike without crash bars. It meant that I ruined half of the bodywork and the paint job. Apparently, crash barriers look stupid and are a way of telling if someone's a newbie or an absolute goofball. This was the sacrifice he made for letting me take the test on his bike. And as a result, he had to fork out thousands of dollars worth of damage. I helped him pay $1,000, but Mike insisted on paying the rest. I agreed with Mike that I wouldn't take my test again until I was 100% certain I could pass, and until I had my own bike. I needed to save up a little more to get a bike that I aimed for. Most in my price range of three to five grand were either too powerful or, for some weird reason, just didn't fit me because I'm under 5'1". Riding the Harley was super difficult. Mike bought this weird booster seat to put on the actual bike seat, making me mount up higher, around another six inches. This meant I could reach the handlebars, and my feet weren't hanging off the pegs. After I failed my test, I went into depressive mode. I didn't talk to Mike for a couple of weeks, and I guess he got the wrong feeling that, somehow, I was no longer interested in him. After a week was up, I decided to try and reach back out to him. But then, I realized that I didn't care anymore. I don't know. But in that moment, I felt like being his friend, or even his girlfriend, was a complete waste of time. Put yourself in my shoes. He spent days, weeks, and months teaching me to try and get me to pass my test. He even let me. Damn Harley, all for me to just fail. Eventually, we did meet up again. And it was at this date where catastrophe took place. We were riding. It was pretty dark, and it was raining heavily. We had agreed just to go for a ride with me on the back of his Harley. We weren't going fast, just cruising at around 50. All of a sudden, we turned off the highway and took a left turn. It was during this left turn that Mike 
let off the gas, but still somehow must have hit something, like some fuel on the road. We slipped, the back tire lost traction, and I went flying into the side of the asphalt. I landed with the left side of my leg ripping against the road, taking two inches off my thigh, and even having my jeans ripped to the bone. When I got up, I was dazed. The pain wasn't really setting in yet, as the adrenaline of the moment had helped numb the pain. As I looked all around, I could see Mike further up on the road. He was lying down, not moving. The bike was smashed a bit, and there were no cars around anywhere, as it was pretty late. Once I had looked at this, I looked down at myself, and that's when I began screaming in shock. I saw my thigh ripped to shreds, blood coming out of my jeans, and I could feel the pain starting to set in. Eventually, Mike came around and regained consciousness. He was fine, could walk, and managed to call 911 to get me help. Every second that 911 didn't come was a second that the pain would intensify. It got so bad and uncomfortable that I tried telling Mike to simply knock me out. I'm not even joking. I told him to punch me and try to get me to knock myself out. He refused. I was screaming in pain, begging for it to end. Eventually, the medics arrived, three ambulances. Mike was seen in one of them, and I was taken away to the hospital in the other. I had surgery, and thanks to the good nurses and surgeons, I'm able to walk again to this day. This accident put me off bikes, and although I still see Mike, I refuse to go on his Harley ever again. I know my family told me it's stupid, and you probably think the exact same, but if you had been through that accident, maybe you'd think like me. I have friends that have had biking accidents. Usually, their fault for going too fast or losing control of the bike. Or it's someone else, like a bad driver who just collides with them. But in this instance, it was simply a stroke of bad luck. It was just some gas on the road that made the back tires slip out and lose all grip. It's kind of scary to think that something as minor as that can cause me to lose chunks out of my thigh. I couldn't walk properly for months thigh had to be reconstructed, and I went through months of physiotherapy to try and rehabilitate my movement and function within the joints. It was a painful process, and overall, it put me off biking altogether. I'm still with Mike, but we choose to take a car now. I drive him around, and no matter how much he begs me to go back on the Harley, promising to keep an eye out for gas on the road. I say no. I simply deny his requests. Had reservations at a fancy restaurant, and everything seemed perfect. Delicious food, top-notch cocktails. But the guy remained seated at the bar, glancing over at her every once in a while. All her photos were recent, her Tinder profile up to date yet he couldn't seem to recognize her or muster the courage to approach her. After finishing her meal and last cocktail, she paid the bill and left. As she got up, she noticed his attention finally turned to her. Instead of coming over, he just stared at her with an unpleasant, creepy look. The situation took an even stranger turn when he got up and followed her out of the bar. At that point, she feared for her safety, unsure if she was about to be abducted, harmed, or confronted by a weirdo who lacked the courage to approach her at the reserved table. Realizing there was no point in running, she turned around on the sidewalk, signaling to him not to mess with her. Standing her ground, she stared him square in the eyes making it clear she would do whatever it took to 
to avoid a dangerous situation, the guy approached, claiming he didn't recognize her and got confused because she looked nothing like her photos. Despite showing him her Tinder profile with recent pictures, he insisted she looked nothing like them. It became a bizarre and uncomfortable encounter where the guy who had paid over $100 to reserve a table couldn't recognize the person he came to meet. In the end, the date turned into an awkward and unsettling experience, leaving her with a story of a Tinder date who couldn't even recognize her in person. On a side note, it's mentioned that the storyteller is 13 years old and the experience is about their mom not themselves. Sure, here's the improved version of the provided text. I hadn't received many details as expected. Why would a mom inform her 13-year-old son about a date with a random stranger? All she told me was roughly what time she'd be back, and that if I needed anything, I just needed to call or text her on her cell phone. She left around six-ish been gone for about two hours. At this point, I was just sitting in my room gaming and talking to my buddies on Call of Duty. The time passed quickly when you're immersed in a game, and it felt like mom left and returned with the snap of a finger. I had been gaming for over three or four hours and hadn't even had dinner, but it was a Friday night, and on Fridays, Mom let me stay up until one or whenever I wanted, which was kind of cool. I went downstairs when I heard her come through the door. As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I was met with the sight of my mom collapsed on the couch. Initially, I thought she might be tired, emphasizing how exhausted she was. Mom was one of those ladies who liked to express her emotions, or so it seemed. When she felt tired, she would do this or say weird things, acting out. I don't know, maybe it's her slight autism, but it's just something she did. I expected her to fake a yawn, say something about the date being long, and then announce it was time for bed. However, she did none of that. She just lay there, not moving much, seemingly conscious. Immediately, I started to wonder if the date went wrong or if something bad had happened. Awkwardly, I stumbled through to the kitchen, deciding to put a TV dinner in the microwave. While doing this, I ran back upstairs, giving mom the privacy I thought she needed. I continued gaming for another 10 minutes until my dinner would be ready. When I came back downstairs, my mom was still in the same position. Suspiciously, I went over to the kitchen pulled out my TV dinner from the microwave and unloaded it from the plastic tub. It was boiling hot and I burnt my fingers on the plastic casing. Ah, I yelled out, but mom didn't say a word. Now this was really bad. Whenever I swore or cursed, my mom knew she was about to give me a scolding. She would come over, pull me by the ear, or even worse, slap me around the face. I was brought up with strict manners and discipline, but as I shouted out, my mom still lay there in the same position, not saying a word, not even an excuse me. Silence. I stopped pouring out the dinner, dropped it on the kitchen counter, and walked straight over to my mom instantly realizing that something was seriously wrong with her. It took me this long to notice, and I felt guilty thinking that maybe she had been dead this whole time. At 13, you tend to sensationalize things, imagining the worst, and not really knowing what to do in dangerous or vulnerable situations. As I went over to her, she was still moving around, kind of moaning or humming in her sleep. It was as if she was having a bad dream or just remembering how the date went. Even at 13, I knew something wasn't right. I had never seen my mom lying on the couch, 
let alone falling asleep on it. Continuing from the previous segment, I had been brought up with etiquette, table manners, and lessons on how to speak properly. So with those teachings in mind, I started to go over to her. I reached out my right hand and nudged her on the shoulder. That's when she replied, but her response was slurred and something felt off. I shook her a bit harder, attempting to wake her up. But no matter how hard I shook her by the shoulders, she wasn't snapping out of this weird, dreary, drowsy state. Realizing the urgency of the situation, I decided to turn around and run straight to the phone. I dialed 911 and got onto the operator, describing my mom's behavior and how she was acting. The people on the other side of the phone bombarded me with questions, asking about my mom's name, her medical history, any pre-existing issues or allergies she might have. They also inquired about how she was behaving, what she looked like, and whether she felt hot or cold. They even asked if there was any discharge from her mouth. This was a lot for a 13-year-old to handle. The ambulance eventually arrived. It turned out that my mom had her drink spiked somehow. The amount wasn't enough to incapacitate her completely, and she had managed to stumble her way home in a taxi. The taxi driver assumed she was severely drunk, but as it turns out, she wasn't drunk at all. The CCTV footage revealed a different and more sinister story, footage of the restaurant. It turns out she'd only had two glasses one, of which showed her date, putting a pill that dissolved into the water. Yep, this is my mom's Tinder horror story, but she gave me permission to post it type it out for her. Be careful. Hey guys. Thank you for listening to tonight's horror story episode. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe if you're new and leave a like on today's video to show your support. Please interact with these videos by commenting down below. You can either comment down below a thank you or a simple thing you liked about the video or maybe comment down below with your opinion on something that happened in any of the stories featured in the video. This helps the channel grow if you interact by commenting down below, and it means a lot here at this channel. I don't sell anything. I don't ask for donations or Patreon or PayPals. I simply ask for likes, comments, and subscribes. Please also share the videos with your friends and family and, and anyone else you think who could benefit from these horror stories. I am in direct competition with the bigger horror story channels, most of which don't upload every day. And in my opinion, all use the same stories from forums on Reddit. My stories are never heard of before. These are stories that have never been used by any other channels. So please support real horror channels and true storytellers. Thank you to everyone watching this video, and I'll catch you in tomorrow evening.